What's up? I'm Rhett. Fix this. Shit. What's up? I'm Rhett with the Heights Lab, and today we're working on this PreSonus R65. Speaker will not power on. Tried different IAC cables, different wall outlets, everything. In the back, there's a fuse. Let's see if we can get that mud out. All right, there's a spare in there. Still no light. Great. Now we can take it apart. On the back, it has eight Phillips heads. The MDF can sometimes be soft, so I like to use a regular hand screwdriver instead of a drill. What I'm hoping is we get in here and there's just some sort of a blown capacitor. It'll be an easy fix. A disconnected cable, maybe. I'm also anxious just to see how the inside of this is made. Oh no. It's been hot glued in. This is very interesting. One down. Hope I'm still taping. All right, let's see if I can set her down. Ooh, so tight. Let's do it like this so we can see. That's not much better. So it's hot glued in right there, this den connector. And as you can see, everything on here is covered in silicone or something like that and now I'm over here uh, so they they put this on there a to to probably keep me from working on it and B uh, just to keep stuff from rattling around when the speaker is booming okay so here's a little bit better look at everything you can see the silicone or let's see some type of glue or foam that they've put all over everything uh, to keep the components in place let's see there appears to be some of the connectors under this this is the light I know that this is the LED light and it connects right here this is your input section this is also glued and this is zip tied to the board but just right off top I do not see any blown capacitors which doesn't mean they're not leaking. Here's the leads for the speakers. I can remove them. They are glued down. I'm first going to snip this zip tie they have. All right, and that frees it up pretty good right there. Let's make sure we didn't cut anything. Man, we came close. That's okay, so they got a heat. I guess it's just to isolate it there. Uh, these speaker connectors, the woofer and the tweeter, are glued to the board. So I'm going to use some acetone to try to remove the glue. So I don't break the connections and have to solder anything more than what I need to. Alright, we're we're getting a hundred and almost a hundred and forty volts depending on where we test at. So it is definitely getting the power to it. Let's see if this is getting power next. Okay. I 
I was unable to measure some of the leads because of the silicone, so I decided to try to remove the circuit board so I could get a better reading on it. So, we had to get some more speakers. We went through several different R65s trying to get one that worked and just couldn't. So Are we done with the PreSonus monitors? Of course not. We'll never be done with the PreSonus monitors. We're here to save them. We did a lot of mixes off of them. I'm just not going to let them go to waste. So, my plan, let me show you. We got up with our friends at Parts Express and got a crossover. That's how we're going to fix them. I was gonna build a crossover, but they conveniently have these two-way crossovers at whatever frequency. As we know, the R65s are crossed over at 2700 hertz. Uh, I got this one at 2500 hertz for a mere $30. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Rhett, the R65s are active monitors. How is a crossover gonna help? Well, taking the power amp out and gonna use this to do the rest, all right? This is a simple two-way crossover. It only has five components. It has three capacitors and two inductor coils. I think it'll work perfect for what we're doing. I also only paid 30 bucks for it. Some metal film capacitors out there are over $30 by themselves. And trust me, the electrolytic pieces of that are used in the R65 currently, I'm, I'm positive are not as good as these Dayton capacitors. We are going to test them though, in fact, and find out because I still have one working so we'll uh, do one my way and then one Presonus's way, and we will A-B them right out of the box with the Dayton Audio Steel crossover. Steel saw. And I'm trying to make it pretty close, but leave enough room so I can sand it down. Old skill saw. All right, now that we've got us a back piece trimmed, we can work on placing our components. First, we have our crossover from Dayton Audio. We'll actually probably position it more in a vertical way. Make sure we got plenty of clearance for the screw holes. Next, we have our posts for our speaker wire. Flip side, which is the same side that the crossover will be seen, will be wiring the negative and positive leads to the input section of the crossover. Here is our woofer and tweeter section. For that, I got these from Parts Express. They're just little crimp ends that we'll be putting on the ends of the speakers, speaker wire that is, to make it a little bit easier to put them on and off. To start, we'll make a hole for our connector terminals. We'll do this using a hole saw drill bit. All right, and now we will be cutting these ends off to make way for our terminals that will connect to our crossover. These posts right here, we're gonna be using these crimp on, no solder, quick disconnect plugs. Also, I'm gonna leave these ferrites on. I've installed a few of them myself on microphone cables just to avoid cell phone signal. We'll start by clipping this end off though. There it goes. So then we're left these two leads. We're going to use our wire strippers. There we go. Now we will twist the ends. When I'm doing it, I like to put the sleeve on first. Now I'll shave a little bit extra of that end off. Slide our end on like so. And we just slide this up over there get a little bit better look at the ends. So this is once again the speaker wires. We're 
go to the woofer and the tweeter, and this will fit into these posts on the crossover. And now we're back with our back. We got it stained and ready to assemble the rest. I'm going to use these two blocks to keep the back off the table as I attach the terminals for the speaker wire. All right, so here's pretty much how the finished back will look on the outside. We've got the terminals bolted on. I also recycled most of these screws from the R65's original back. So, look, that's not too bad, is it? So now we'll go ahead and solder the speaker wire terminals to the crossover. So let's wire it all up before we glue it together just to make sure everything works. Give it a test run. Should be good enough. Those quick connect pins aren't very quick. Now we'll connect our banana pins to our speaker terminal. Here's a quick side by side of the back, before and after. Not too bad looking. As we can see here in the spec sheet, the R65 runs at about 150 watts of power. It uses a bi-amped Class D amplifier, 50 watts for the tweeter and 50 watts for the woofer. I am going to be using a Crown XLS1000, which is also a Class D amplifier, with a little bit more juice. I took my own measurement of the factory R65 so we would be sure that our measurement was free of any discrepancies from room or the measurement microphone frequencies. When we lay the graphs on top of each other, we can see that our tweeter sits about 10 dB higher after 6K. To correct this, we can go a couple of ways about it. One, we'll be using a resistor. Here we have a couple of different size resistors from half an ohm up to four ohms that we will actually put in of the tweeter to increase the resistance 
so it will decrease the output. The second would be an L pad. This is a giant 8 ohm L pad that we ordered from Parts Express, Dayton Audio brand. Way bigger than what I expected, but I think it'll get the job done. And it also comes with a little face plate that you can mount on the back so you would have an independent volume control. I am going to undo the speaker and try both methods with alligator clamps just to see which one will be the best for our, our Frankenstein of a monitor. First, our uh, half ohm, 0 0.51 actually. All right, here's the half ohm resistor. So if we lay the graphs on top of each other, you can see that top end working its way down. Next up is the one ohm resistor. Last but not least, we'll go four ohms. Now, with the four ohm resistor, you can see we're much closer to where we need to be. There's only about 10 dB of fluctuation between the frequency, which makes it relatively flat. We can probably tune the rest down with an equalizer. But now, let's go ahead and now, check out the L pad. We will test the L pad. First test it with it wide open. Here we can see the L pad turned off but still in series. And when you lay it on top of the other frequency graph, they're pretty much a match. It's very transparent. Let's crank it up. the L pad turned all the way up, we can see when you lay it on top of the graph, it shows our crossover point a little bit closer to 2K. It's also very powerful. It turns stuff down well over 20 decibels. With the back on the monitor, we can see a lot of the low end has been tightened up. We're going to be using the 4 ohm wire wound resistor and fine tune the dips with our graphic equalizer. This is still pretty fair for our comparison because the R65 originally has the DSP. This will allow us to tame the curves and make our frequency response possibly flatter than the original factory speaker. Not to mention that the upgrades cost less than simply getting it checked at the factory. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.